It is a great honor and a distinct pleasure for me to have been invited to deliver this year's ICMA lecture at the Courtauld, a place that welcomed me as a student 20 years ago and of which I have many fond memories. It is, a, it is wonderful to be back here after so many years on this occasion and I would like to express my deep gratitude and appreciation to my former teachers John Loudon, Joanna Cannon and Paul Crosley. If they had not taken me on as a young German postgraduate student hopelessly unfamiliar with London, the English language and the British educational system and treated me with much patience and kindness, the world of art history would not have opened up to me in the way it did. And I am certain that I would not stand in front of you today without their help and guidance. While I cannot comfortably claim to be an Italianist, I chose today's topic mainly for two reasons. Firstly, because a research and conservation project on the Academia's famous Stauroteca del Cardinal Bessarione gave me a rare opportunity to investigate the long-term impact of Byzantine relic imports on the Lagoon City, and secondly, because it allowed me to pay my humble respects and homage to a colleague who always encouraged me to look closely at things Venetian, and who left us much too early last summer namely my colleague David Rosand. Separated from each other by almost a thousand nautical miles, yet inextricably linked to one another by a long history of political, commercial and cultural interactions, the Byzantine capital Constantinople and Venice were arguably the most prosperous and culturally refined cities in the medieval Mediterranean. Venice, as Donald Nicol once noted, was born as a province of the Byzantine Empire, grew into an ally, came of age as a partner, and matured as the owner of extensive colonial possessions within the disintegrating structure of the Byzantine world. But not only in terms of its political, commercial, and cultural ambition did Venice mature from an ally to a partner, to a powerful rival of Byzantium, also as a collector and guardian of sacred objects did Venice compete with and eventually supersede the Byzantine Empire and its capital. By the early 14th century, Constantinople lay largely despoiled of its once famous ecclesiastical treasures. Many of them were now scattered across Western Europe, having found new homes in the most prestigious churches and monasteries of France and Germany, who had received them as pious gifts from crusading knights, traveling bishops, or entrepreneurial clerics who had crossed the seas and visited Constantinople on their way to Cyprus and the Levant during the course of the 13th century. No single church or city in Northern Europe, however, could rival either Paris or Venice in terms of the quantity and quality of their holdings in Byzantine sacred objects. In Venice, the earliest surviving inventories of the treasury of San Marco, composed in 1283 and 1325 respectively, present us with a vivid picture of the influx of wealth, both material and spiritual, that resulted from the conquest of Constantinople in 1204, and more than five decades of privileged access to Byzantium's most sacred sites and valued treasures. While Venetian efforts to acquire new relics slowed down considerably after the end of the Latin domination of Constantinople in 1261, prominent Eastern relics continued to enter the Rialto even during the 14th and 15th centuries, enriching the city's foremost churches, religious confraternities, and public institutions with unprecedented spiritual and miracle working power. In my talk today, I will focus on two such relics, both of them relics of the True Cross. One of them was donated to the confraternity or Scuola of San Giovanni Evangelista in 1369, the other one to the Scuola of Santa Maria della Carità almost exactly a hundred years later, namely in 1472. Their stories, while well known through written accounts, painted narratives and the material record of their precious containers, have much to tell us, as I hope to be able to show, about the important role relics, especially relics of Christ, played as powerful tokens and agents of the divine, a role not restricted to the religious sphere, 
but one that extended into the very capillary system of the late medieval city's political and social life. Before focusing on these two objects and the late medieval city in which they arrived, it will be useful, I think, to take a closer look at the early history of relics on the Rialto, especially as far as Eastern imports and relics of Christ's Passion are concerned. This will help us to illuminate the broader historical context for the presence and veneration of Eastern relics in 14th and 15th century Venice, and provide an important interpretive dimension for our assessment of the specific conditions that allowed these relics to wield their miraculous powers. From late antiquity through the Middle Ages and beyond, relics of Christ's Passion were collected and treasured by individuals and Christian communities in both the Byzantine Empire and the Western world. While some cities, such as Jerusalem and Rome, gained considerable profile as repositories of these most cherished relics as early as the fourth century, others, such as the imperial capital Constantinople, joined their ranks as cities with prominent relic holdings only in the following centuries through the collecting activities of high-ranking members of the imperial family, monastic communities, or direct imperial efforts to safeguard relics, especially those of Christ's Passion, from other sites and cities in the empire during periods of war and crisis. The Byzantine Empire's most important collection of relics, which included a large, por large portion of the True Cross, the Holy Lands, and other relics of Christ's Passion, were kept at the Church of the Virgin of the Pharos, a chapel located, and I quote, in the midst of the Imperial Palace, end quote, close to the famous beacon or lighthouse. This church had been rebuilt and lavishly refurbished after the end of iconoclasm, and gradually assumed the role of the Empire's Holy of Holies, a place that by the time of the Crusader conquest of Constantinople was praised by its treasurer Nicolaus Mezarites as, quote, another Sinai, a Bethlehem, a Jordan, a Jerusalem, a Nazareth, and so on, end of quote. Following the sack of Constantinople and the subsequent looting of its churches, chapels and palaces, yet another city, namely Venice, should enter the stage as a key repository of sacred relics of the highest order. Yet the city's subsequent fame as a second Constantinople and New Jerusalem was not merely an accidental result of the conquest of the imperial capital. It was the logical consequence of a series of earlier attempts to endow the city with powerful saintly protectors. Already in 819, Venice had received an important gift of relics from Emperor Leo V, a donation that comprised, quote, the body of the holy prophet Zechariah, a fragment of the true cross, parts of the garments of Christ and his mother, and many, many other treasures, end of quote. This imperial favor was the likely result of the strong personal and political ties Agnolo Participatio had established with the Byzantine Empire in the early decades of the 9th century, an effort honored in his official recognition as Doge by a Byzantine embassy in 811. Leo's gift of relics seems to have been more than a public demonstration of the emperor's favor towards the province that, after years of crisis, had started to consolidate and establish its, its political center more permanently on the islands of the Rialto. The fact that Leo is also said to have contributed funds and expertise to the construction of the monastery that was to house the relics of Saint Zachariah may further indicate that the gift of relics was not an isolated act of generosity but the beginning of a strong Byzantine interest in supporting the new foundations on the Rialto. The selection of relics sent to Venice is likewise significant as it actively supports Venice's struggle for independence in matters of ecclesiastical policy. Already in the middle of the sixth century, the Byzantine emperor had used similar tactics to bolster Ravenna's effort to raise its ecclesiastical profile to the rank of the much older and more prestigious archbishoprics of Rome and Milan by sending relics of the apostles Peter, Paul, John, Andrew, and Thomas, as well as of 
St. John the Baptist and Zechariah to the Byzantine stronghold in Italy. After the fall of Ravenna in 751, it was now Venice, Byzantium's most important ally in the northern Adriatic, who became the recipient of important relics of Christ the Virgin and a biblical saint to secure its ties with the capital and raise its ecclesiastical profile in the region. How serious Byzantium's interest in Venice was can be deduced from the types of relics given on the occasion. Parts of the True Cross, the Veil of the Virgin, and the Tunic of Christ ranked among the Byzantine Emperor's proudest possessions and were regarded as powerful palladia. One may recall that it was these very relics that reportedly saved Constantinople miraculously from the assaults of Thomas the Slav in 822, when Patriarch Antonios and the son of Emperor Michael II, Theophilos, paraded them over the city ramparts. As the translatio of the relics of St. Mark to Venice only a few years later in 828 shows, Venetians were by no means satisfied with the status of passive recipient of spiritually efficacious and politically opportune relics. As has been pointed out by various scholars, the timing of the translation of the relics of St. Mark to Venice leaves some suspicion that it was a direct and conscious response to the partisan decision reached at the Synod of Mantua in 827, which backed Aquileia in its ongoing struggle against Grado for episcopal primacy. Contrary to the earliest surviving accounts of the Translatio, which insist that the reigning doge Justiniano knew nothing about the translation until the body of the saint actually reached the shores of the Rialto, it may not be too far-fetched to assume that the doge took a more active role in acquiring the relics, even though his Byzantine overlords had just recently pro prohibited both travel and commercial contacts with Syria and Egypt. The acquisition of additional relics through gift, trade and theft remained an important means to raise Venice's political and ecclesiastical profile for centuries to come. At the end of the 10th century, the future doge Pietro Babolano was able to purchase the relics of St. Sabas from the custodians of his relics in Constantinople. And in 10, 1004, Emperor Basil II sent relics of St. Barbara as a wedding present to Giovanni Orseolo, son of Doge Pietro II and his Byzantine bride Maria Argyropolaina. Other saintly remains arrived in Venice merely two decades later. As recorded in Andrea Dandolo's chronicle, the relics of the saintly Bishop Tarasios were allegedly discovered by a Venetian merchant in a ruined monastery near the promontory named Kilendro, likely the Tarasios monastery north of Hestiae Annapolis on the Bosphorus. According to Dandolo's report, the merchants carried the saint's body on board their ships and brought it to the lagoon where they were received by the bishop, clerics and people of Venice with incomparable devotion and placed for veneration in the church of San Zaccaria. More important than the remains of the saintly bishop Tarasios, yet no less controversial, were the relics of another famous bishop, namely Saint Nicholas, who arrived in Venice around 1100 together with his homonymous uncle and the martyr Theodore. According to the Translatio Sancti Nicolai and other sources, they were brought to the Rialto from Mura by Enrico Contarini, the Bishop of Castello. Since the Venetian account of the miraculous finding of the relics was backed by two of the most prominent members of society, Bishop Enrico Contarini and Giovanni Michiel, the son of the Doge and leader of the Venetian mission to Mira, there was, in the eyes of the Venetians, little doubt that the people from Bari had taken the wrong body by mistake. Whereas in the case of St. Nicholas, the Venetians had been willing to compensate the bewildered Bishop of Mura for his loss with gold, no similar attempts at restitution were made in this case of the relics of St. Stephen, who was stolen in broad daylight from one of the saints' churches in Constantinople in 1109. Once received on the Rialto, Dojo de la Forfalie solemnly 
deposited the saint's relics in the northern transept of San Giorgio Maggiore and thus gave the theft retroactive blessing. Although the scandalous behavior of the Venetians in Constantinople was noticed by the Byzantine emperor and resulted in the temporary suspension of all Venetian trade privileges, such measures did not prevent further thefts and the clandestine removal of relics from Byzantine churches, monasteries, and oratories. In 1124, for instance, after a successful intervention on behalf of the Crusaders at Tyrus, the Venetian fleet put up its winter quarters on the island of Chios. Before they left, they despoiled the island of one of its most prized possessions, namely the body of the martyr Saint Isidore. It was solemnly received in Venice when the fleet returned home in 1125. Although Venetian merchants and mercenaries had shown little hesitation to steal relics in previous centuries, both the quantity and quality of holy bodies acquired during and after the con conquest of Constantinople by far exceeds all previous acquisitions. The four most important were undoubtedly the objects mentioned in Doge Andrea Dandolo's 14th century chronicle as having been sent by his predecessor Enrico Dandolo as gifts to the Basilica of San Marco, a relic of the true cross decorated with gold and precious stones, a relic of the holy blood, a fragment of the skull of St. John the Baptist, and the arm of St. George. They are pictured here, augmented by an additional reliquary cross in a marble relief installed just behind the treasury of San Marco in the so-called Andito Foscari. Three of these relics, namely the true cross, a crystal ampoule with the blood of Christ, and a piece of the skull of St. John the Baptist are first mentioned in a ducal letter by Doge Raniero Zen, sent to his ambassadors in Rome on May 30th, 1265. According to the letter, which interestingly says nothing about the date and the circumstances of the relic's arrival in Venice, the holy items had miraculously escaped a fire that devastated the treasury of San Marco in 1231. Advising his ambassadors to support a delegation of Dominicans and Franciscans in obtaining official papal acknowledgement of the miraculous survival of these relics, the Doge further stressed that the relics transfer from Jerusalem to Venice via Constantinople was the result of divine agency, working through Helena and ultimately through Christ himself who, quote, wanted the relics of his divine presence on earth to be placed within those of his evangelist Mark. Unfortunately, despite the Doge's earnest yet belated efforts, the Pope refused to acknowledge the miracle working qualities of the relics, thus devastating Venetian hopes to make these relics the focal point of a dedicated cult of dominical relics at the Church of St. Marco. As I have shown elsewhere, Andrea Dandolo's attempts in the 14th century to associate San Marco's most venerated relics with his namesake and predecessor Enrico takes the earlier efforts to propagate the Basilica's miracle working relics a step further by explicitly linking divine with ducal agency. In other words, the relics pre presence in Venice was still attributed to a divine plan, but this divine plan was now said to have worked through the person of the Doge, namely Enrico Dandolo, who is alleged to have sent the relics from Constantinople to San Marco, just as Helena previously sent them from Jerusalem to her son in Constantinople. What Andrea Dandolo must have realized as well is that art could play an important role in both highlighting the extraordinary status of San Marco's most distinguished relics and authenticating their long-standing cult and miracle working history. We can see this playing out in the already mentioned case of the relics of Saint Isidore, for which Dandolo commissioned both a chapel and an extensive cycle of mosaics that depict the story of Doge Domenico Michiel's invention of the relic on the island of Chios. Little is known about these relics at San Marco in the intervening centuries. But the relics discovery or rediscovery there during Dandolo's Dogado 
and the Doe's decision to visualize the events in a monumental and publicly visible format established and actualized their existence and cult history once and for all. While Venetian efforts to acquire new relics for the religious institutions on the Rialto slowed down considerably after the end of the Latin domination of Constantinople, the city's role as a destination and center for the trade in high-profile relics and reliquaries from Byzantium and the Eastern Mediterranean can hardly be underestimated. This is perhaps most clearly attested in the acquisition of a substantial collection of relics and other precious items by the hospital of Santa Maria della Scala in Siena in 1359. The deal was sealed, as it were, in Venice on May 28, 1359, by Andrea Grazia, a syndic of the Ospedale, and Pietro Torrigiani, a Florentine-born merchant, Venetian citizen, and resident of Constantinople, when a contract was drawn up that stipulated the conditions of the transfer of objects recently acquired in Constantinople. Information concerning the provenance of the relic collection is provided by a document that apparently accompanied the contract of 1359 as an authentication. Issued at Pera on December 15, 1357 by the papal legate to Constantinople, the Carmelite Peter Thomas, and witnessed by three bishops as well as the Dominican Inquisitor Philip de Contis, the document recounts that Peter Thomas having heard about Pietro Torrigiani's relic collection, had visited the residence of the Venetian Bailo of Constantinople, likely Maffeo Venier, in the company of the co-signing bishops to examine, quote, with eyes and hands, the precious relics, among which were to be found even those of Christ and the true cross on which he had hung, end of quote. The document further states that in order to assure the authenticity and provenance of these relics, Thomas had sent two of the bishops and the inquisitor to Empress Irene, wife of Emperor John VI Cantacuzenos, who in turn testified that the relics had indeed come from the imperial palace, that they had been put up for sale in the lodger of the Venetians out of necessity, and that there were, quote, no relics more precious in the whole empire than these." End of quote. After presenting a list of the relics examined, Thomas finally asserts, and I quote again, that it seems as if the Lord Jesus Christ himself had led Torrigiani to Constantinople in order to take the relics out of the hands of the schismatics and bring them to a holy place just like the children of Israel were led out of Egypt by divine mandate. End of quote. The document concludes with a plea that Chorigiani may, and I quote again, bring the relics to our Lord the Pope and the most serene Prince and Lord Emperor of the Romans, since such priceless objects suit them best. End of quote. The original purpose of this document is somewhat difficult to determine, but it may nonetheless serve as a clear indicator of how radically the Latin conquest of, and occupation of Constantinople had reshaped the traditional role of, of the Byzantine Empire, Emperor as a guardian and distributor of dominical relics. Rather than bestowing such items as an act of imperial favor and high, to high-ranking foreign dignitaries, the imperial household was now forced to sell them out of hard economic necessity. As I have shown some time ago, the consequences of this development for the recipients of such sacred commodities are complex. It not only created the need for institutional authentication, in, the case, in this case by the Byzantine Empress and Papal Legate, it also resulted in efforts to disguise the commercial nature of these transactions. Instead of a purchase, the Venetian contract of 1359 repeatedly speaks of a donatio, a donation, despite the fact that the merchant was to receive a purely monetary compensation of 3,000 gold florins to be paid in six monthly installments and the provision of a lifetime residence in Siena. But let me return to those relics that actually stayed in Venice during the 14th century and began to enrich the city with their spiritual and miracle working power. Among them was first and foremost a fragment of the true cross, 
donated to the Confraternity of San Giovanni Evangelista on December 23, 1369, by Philippe de Maizière, then Grand Chancellor of Cyprus, who had come to Venice first in 1362 with Peter of Lusignan, and repeatedly thereafter to drum up financial and military support for a new crusade. Curiously enough, the origin of de Maizière's relic is linked to the same Peter Thomas we encountered as the authenticator of Pietro Torrigiani's Byzantine relic hoard, and who had, in 1363 and 1364 respectively, advanced to the rank of Archbishop of Crete and Latin Patriarch of Constantinople. As we know through both Philippe de Maizière's will, registered in Venice in January 1370, and the privilege of donation, a document dated a month later, the relic of the true cross had been given to Philippe by his beloved friend and mentor Peter on his deathbed in Famagosta in 1366. The act of donation further explains that Peter had in turn received the relic from elders of a Syrian Christian community while on the road to the Holy Land in 1360. Interestingly, Philippe de Maizière does not mention this episode with a word in his life of Peter Thomas, even though it would have greatly enhanced Peter's reputation as a charismatic leader, as Kirill Petkov recently stressed. While doubts about the veracity of the story are thus in order, in the context of its donation to the Confraternity of San Giovanni, it serves an important purpose. It links the relic to a person of proven ecclesiastical authority, who had both means and opportunity to acquire such a treasure in legitimate ways, directly from a source, however reputable, in the Holy Land. Authentication of the relic in 1369 was ensured, as attested by the privilege of donation, through the presence of a number of witnesses, including the Franciscan Ludovico Dona, who served as the order spiritual and principal lecturer at the University of Pisa, and more importantly, in this context, as inquisitor for Venice and Treviso. Since both the relic and its rock crystal reliquary cross have survived and are preserved at their former home in the squalor of San Giovanni Evangelista, it is worth examining it here in greater detail. The cross of San Giovanni Evangelista belongs to a group of richly decorated Venetian processional crosses of a type often called Tatzenkreuz in German-speaking scholarship due to its char characteristic paw-like terminal ends. The body of the cross consists of five separate panels of rock crystal, three of which have been replaced by glass in subsequent periods. The roughly square-shaped panel at the center and the lower of the two paw-shaped vertical cross arms are preserved in their original condition. Each crystal panel is framed by a silver gilt decorative border, consisting of a somewhat drawn-out egg and dart frieze and a band of palmettes that grow towards the center of each crystal panel. From each of the terminal ends sprout silver gilt tendrils carrying an alternating sequence of cone-shaped blossoms and busts of prophets. Of the originally ten prophet busts, seven have been preserved in their original form, while three have been replaced. Two strong branches growing out of the cross's hexagonal microarchitectural node flank the lower cross arm on both sides and carry the silver gilt figure of the Virgin on one side and Saint John on the other. As such, the cross of San Giovanni Evangelista reflects a cross type first witnessed in the 13th century treasury relief and associated with one of San Marco's Byzantine relics of the true cross. Rather than being inserted into the reliquary cross proper, the fragments of the true cross are mounted here at the apex of the upper cross arm in a small house-shaped rock crystal container. The container itself is carried by two putti, which, like the crowning figure of an angel with a sudarium and the holy face of Christ and the prominent ruby, are later additions. The arrangement confirms a passage in the will of Philippe de Maizière, which elaborates on the fact that the relic 
was already encased in a crystal container before its donation to the Scuola. Completing the figural decoration of the Cross of San Giovanni is a silver gilt crucifix on the front as well as on the back the figure of a bearded Saint John spreading his mantle to protect two kneeling confratelli. While clearly a pastiche in its current configuration, the cross has thus far been dated to the second half of the 14th or early 15th century, as it shares certain stylistic qualities with works of the so-called Sesto workshop, a family of Venetian goldsmiths and coin cutters attested in the last decade of the 14th and the first half of the 15th century. Proof of the fact that the commission of the cross can indeed be tied to Philippe de Maizière's donation of the relic can be presented here now for the first time in the form of two inscriptions that have hitherto escaped scholars' attention. These inscriptions, placed on the consoles carrying the Gothic edicules immediately above and uh, below the micro-architectural node, name Andrea Vendramin, the Guardian Grande of the Scuola di San Giovanni Evangelista of de Maizière's relic coronation and his company, as well as the date of the completion of the cross, namely November 15, 1369. While the cross clearly underwent later modifications, the newly discovered inscriptions confirm unequivocally that the core of the reliquary cross of San Giovanni Evangelista was commissioned by its guardian grande Andrea Vendramin and the governing board of the Scuola more than a month before the solemn donation of the relic took place in a public ceremony on December 23, 1369. Its completion may, in fact, even have been the reason why de Maizière donated the relic to the confraternity at this time, and contrary to his will, in which he had specified that he intended to donate it to the church where his mortal remains would eventually be laid to rest. The sudden change of heart is curious and cannot easily be explained. More important, however, than the ultimate reasons for the donation of the relic is the fact that it started to work miracles almost immediately. The first miracle occurred already in March 1370, barely three months after the relic's donation, likely during its first public procession. When carried over the bridge of San Lorenzo, the cross bearer tumbled and the new crystal cross with its relic fell over the parapet into the canal. Miraculously, it did not sink but hovered above the water until Van Andrea Vendramin, the guardian grande of the confraternity, jumped into the canal to retrieve it. Less than two weeks later, the relic performed its second miracle, this time saving two of Vendramin's ships carrying olive oil from perishing in a storm at sea. Seven more miracles involving the relic should occur in the following hundred years, a third one already in the early 1370s, two more in 1409 and 1414 respectively, yet another one in 1440, um, then one in 1461 and a final one in 1480. While the cross acquired a reputation as Miraculosa across Venice and is known as such in a number of 15th century sources, the first written account that attests to the miracles in any detail uh, only dates from the late 15th century. It is an incunable published around 1490 that recounts the relic's origin, the circumstances of its donation to the Scuola of San Giovanni Evangelista and the miracles it worked to date. The second source is a monumental cycle of paintings we have already seen Bellini's miracle on the bridge of San Lorenzo, commissioned by the confraternity from the most prominent painters in the city, namely Gentile Bellini, Lazzaro Bastiani, Giovanni Mansueti, Benedetto Rusconi, and Vittore Carpaccio, to decorate their Sala dell'Albergo around the same time. The fact that the incunable and the painting cycle were commissioned just around the same time at the end of the 15th century is no coincidence but rather the result of the arrival of yet another precious relic of the True Cross in Venice, only a few years prior, in 1472. Once again, the relic was a donation, 
by a high-ranking official to one of Venice's foremost confraternities. But unlike Philippe de Maizière, he was a high-ranking cleric and one with a Byzantine pedigree to boot. The relic and its containers were a donation of one of the city's oldest and most distinguished religious confraternities, namely the Scuola of Santa Maria della Carità, and its donor was none else but the Greek cardinal and humanist Vasilius Bessarion. Perhaps best known for his participation in the Ecumenical Council of Ferrara and Florence, at which he emerged as a key figure in the negotiations for a union of the churches, Bessarion was made a cardinal of the Roman Church in 1439 and settled in Rome, where his palazzo became an important meeting place for Italian humanists and Greeks who fled Constantinople following the Ottoman conquest in 1453. The circumstances that led to this donation are well known through a number of documents, most of which survive in near contemporary or later copies. In July 1463, ten years after the conquest of Constantinople, Pope Pius II sent Bessarion to Venice in an attempt to rekindle and promote the idea of a crusade against the Ottoman Turks. It was not the first time Bessarion visited Venice. Already in 1438, Bessarion had visited Venice in the company of Emperor John VIII and Patriarch Joseph II on his way to the Council of Florence and Ferrara, a visit famously recorded by Sylvester Siropoulos. A second visit followed in 1461 on the way back from a papal diplomatic mission to Germany. On this occasion, he was invited to sign the Golden Book of the city and also to join the city's great council as an honorary member. When he returned in 1463, Bessarion was received with even greater honors. As was befitting for a Roman cardinal traveling as a papal legate, the Doge and Senate went out to meet him in the lagoon on the Bucintoro, the Doge's great ceremonial barge with chants, acclamations, and church bells resounding from all parts of the city. It was not the last honor bestowed on Bessarion in Venice, for a few weeks after his arrival in Venice, Marco da Costa, the Guardian Grande of the Scuola della Carità, and a delegation of its most prominent members went to visit the Cardinal on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore and solemnly invited him to join their confraternity as a member. Bessarion accepted the honor and accompanied the delegation back to the Rialto in festive procession. Once there, Bessarion vowed in gratitude to bestow a special gift on the confraternity, namely, and I quote, a wooden panel with a cruciform recess in its center, and placed in the recess a golden cross of the finest workmanship. And to its sides, inside the panel, of course, are placed above two pieces of the true cross and two fragments of the tunic of Christ, namely of the Sakos. And this same panel has on top another painted panel serving as a lid, which is similarly decorated with gilded silver." End of quote. As the attested act of donation further states, the panel had previously belonged to Gregorio Mammas, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who had fled Constantinople for Rome after the Ottoman conquest. On his deathbed in 1459, he had bequeathed the reliquary to Bessarion, who in turn promised it to the Scuola della Carità, with a sole provision that he would like to hold on to it during his lifetime. Two letters, one written by the Cardinal on May 12, 1472, and the other by the confraternity acknowledging receipt of the gift, highlight the further history of the object. In the spring of 1472, the ailing Bessarion had been sent to France on yet another papal mission, when he suddenly decided in Bologna that it was time to hand over the promised gift, which had meanwhile, and I quote, further been adorned with silver and fitted with a pole so that it could suitably be displayed in the context of pious devotion. Three trusted men from the Cardinal's familia were sent as couriers to hand over the precious panel, which according to the confraternity's reply, arrived in Venice in early June. At the request of the Senate, the reliquary was first displayed on the high altar of San Marco on Trinity Sunday. 
and then carried in solemn procession through the city and across the Grand Canal into the Scuola della Carità, accompanied by the entire populace chanting hymns. No visual record of this solemn procession survives. However, one of the paintings commissioned to record the miracles performed by the True Cross of the Scuola of San Giovanni Evangelista, following its donation in 1369, does exactly that, at the time when Bessarion's gift of a large Byzantine reliquary was still fresh in the memory of the Venetian populace. Gentile Bellini's 1496 depiction of the miraculous intervention that occurred in April 25, 1444, during a procession in St. Mark's Square on the occasion of the patron saint's feast day, visualizes a similar procession, yet foregrounding the relic of San Giovanni Evangelista within it. As Patricia Fortini Brown has argued, what we are witnessing here is a forceful competition between two of Venice's most prominent squale for the primacy of their relic of the true cross. And I would add that it is fought out by means of a full-fledged media war involving both painted and printed matter. While the Scuola of the Carità commissioned a tabernacle for its albergo to keep alive the memory of its pious donor and those in the confraternity who received the gift in 1472, the Scuola of San Giovanni Evangelista soon thereafter commissioned a written record of all miracles so far performed by its relic. It also decided to monumentalize and actualize the miracles in a grand cycle of paintings that turned its own albergo into a diorama of divine dispensation working through its relic of the True Cross in contemporary Venice. But this scenario would imply that the squalor of San Giovanni Evangelista indeed felt a threat to its own venerable relic and its long established miracle working tradition. At the face of it, there was little doubt about the authenticity of the relic of San Giovanni, given its association with Philippe de Maizière and the Latin patriarch of Constantinople, Peter Thomas, its attested donation to the Scuola in 1369, and the commissioning of a precious reliquary by its guardian grande, Andrea Vendramin, and members of the Scuola's governing board. Yet there was one aspect that must have filled the members of the Scuola of San Giovanni with great anxiety in and after June 1472. Visually speaking, the small splinters of the true cross that had been donated by de Maizière a hundred years prior and were so artfully integrated into the larger crystal cross of 1369 seemed far less impressive than the Byzantine reliquary of Cardinal Bessarion which followed a long tradition of panel-shaped containers of the true cross in the Byzantine Empire and connected it to such venerable imperial examples as the famous Limburg Stavrothiki from around the middle of the 10th century. Like the Stavrothiki from Limburg, the Bessarion reliquary follows the Byzantine format of a rectangular box with a sliding lid and features a large double and even triple-armed cross that could be taken out of its precious container for private devotions. And like the Limburg Stavrothiki, the reliquary of Bessarion features smaller relics, smaller relics placed in chambers on either side of the central cross. In terms of their basic visual rhetoric, therefore, both reliquaries seem to make the same claim, namely that the central detachable cross is or contains fragments of the relic of the true cross and that this reliquary cross is further charged by surrounding it with additional relic content. In the case of Limburg, relics of Christ's childhood and passion, the Virgin and St. John the Baptist. A lengthy inscription on the reliquary cross in Limburg furthermore clarifies that the emperors Constantine and Romanos deemed the wood of the cross worthy to be encrusted with precious stones and pearls because Christ had gushed forth on it the energies of life. A similar claim is made visually by the Bessarion cross, which is covered in the finest silver gilt filigree, artfully arranged in undulating scroll motifs, thus visualizing the sprouting forces of life. Like the Limburg Stavrothiki, the Bessarion reliquary carries a lengthy inscription, not on its back, but rather on its sides. 
The form of the cross venerated around the world was adorned with silver by the daughter of the emperor's brother, Irene Palaiologina, for the forgiveness of her sins and the reward of salvation. This inscription, I would argue, is the only hint that provides us with a true understanding of the cataclysmic divide between the two reliquaries. As the word typos reveals, the detachable cross of the Bessarion reliquary is not a reliquary cross. It is a sign or symbol of Christ's life-giving cross, not the actual material substance of the true cross on which Christ was crucified. This difference is crucial because it attests that the relic content of the reliquary of Bessarion is, after all, limited to the small rectangular chambers flanking the filigree cross on either side. Again, visually speaking, both the Venetian reliquary of San Giovanni Evangelista and the Byzantine reliquary of Santa Maria della Carita thus work in similar ways. They frame the small splinters of the relic of the true cross enclosed in them in ways that aggrandize their miracle working potential. However, despite its distinguished provenance and the grand rhetoric of its filigree cross and painted Byzantine container, the relic of Santa Maria della Carita ultimately failed to produce the miracles necessary to compete with the well-seasoned and highly esteemed relic of San Giovanni. It also failed because the squalor of San Giovanni ultimately mounted a more successful media campaign to propagate and cement its relics history and miracle working power in the minds and hearts of their Venetian contemporaries. It was not the last time a rival confraternity took up the challenge and vied for attention and primacy of their relic of the True Cross. In 1499, when Ambrogio Contari, a patrician member of the Scuola of San Marco and well-known seafarer, was gravely ill and lay on his deathbed, he called Bernardino de Grassi, the guardian grande of the Scuola, and its scrivan, Vettor Ciliol, to his home. There he presented them with a reliquary cross of gold that contained a fragment of the true cross. He vowed that he had obtained it in Constantinople and that, quote, because of its virtue of its relic, some devils of hell had been expelled from the body, end of quote. While the confraternity was not in immediate position to act upon this astounding revelation, monthly processions were ordered a few years later, in 1505, for the cross to be carried to the high altar of the neighboring church of Santi Giovanni e Paolo, lest, quote, such a worthy relic should go without due veneration. The following year, a silver and crystal reliquary tabernacle was ordered for the relic, which was now carried not in monthly but daily processions. By 1512, miracles were cited in the Squala's records, and Ciliol, the former Scrivan and now Guardian Grande of the Squala, approached Patriarch Antonio Contarini with a request to order all churches of Venice to proclaim faith in the genuineness of the relic and its healing powers. The Patriarch quickly approved the request and ordered 40 days of indulgences for all men and women who visited the cross, and with it the prestige and income of the Scuola increased exponentially. Let me conclude. From the time of Raniero Zen in the second half of the 13th century on, we have seen Venetian doges make considerable efforts to put the miracle working qualities of their most prominent relics on record and thus increase the visibility and miracle working potential that they carried. While Zen still relied to, on established processes and sought papal approval for the miracles worked by the relics of San Marco, his 14th century successor Andrea Dandolo began to promote the relic's fame by emphasizing their venerable history and ties to the ducal office. He did so by means of writing them quite literally into the historical record, and in the case of St. Isidore, by commissioning a monumental narrative picture cycle in the space in which they were kept. During the course of the 14th and into the early 16th century, we witnessed several efforts, not by the Doge, but by the city's religious confraternities and their leaders, 
not only to acquire and become guardians of new treasures, but also to serve as impresarios of their numinous powers. As we have seen in the case of the relic of the True Cross, or rather its newly arrived fragmented remains, a Byzantine pedigree or Eastern provenance was still an important prerequisite to unlock its miracle working potential. However, the impresarios at Venice's foremost confraternities had learned that stagecraft and the public performance of a relic's efficacy was at least as important as its Eastern provenance in creating the proper environment in which mere wood and bones could become relics and wield their miraculous powers. I thank you very much for your kind attention.